My name is Darcy Remble from Effect Hope, and I have the pleasure of being joined today by best-selling Christian author Philip Yancey. Well, it's my pleasure, Darcy. Yeah, I, I am looking forward to this. So let's dive right in. Uh, you've written uh, a lot of books over the years. Uh, your most recent is a memoir, uh, Where the Light Fell. And right. I'm just curious, how does it feel having your whole very personal story just out there for the world? Well, it feels like I didn't get fully dressed this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saved some of the most poignant stories in, in my life, which occurred in childhood. For a long time, mainly because other people were involved, people I cared about, my family. And as my wife says, it's kind of a prequel to my other books. You can mm. you can see what I've been interested in writing about, and usually they involve suffering or grace. Those are the two themes that keep occurring in my books. And when you read my memoir, Where the Light Fell, you can see the stories behind them and why I was driven to write about those two topics. Just as you mentioned some of those themes and so interesting to see you know the childhood stories and then you know things that I would have read in where's God when it hurts and things like that right uh, I did hear you say on uh, on a podcast even if you tell the truth as honestly as you can people are going to get hurt so mm. I imagine is that part of the reason you hung on to some of these stories or? It, it is yes I have a dysfunctional family I, a lot of people do <laughs> And there were, on, there were only three of us. My father died when I was just a year old, so I have no memories of him at all. So there were only three of us, my brother and I, and my mother, now a widow. And my brother and mother had not spoken in over 50 years when I wrote the memoir. I thought it could be, it, it could just worsen the rift between us. Actually, the opposite happened. They had their first contact by phone after I published the memoir, and then had a little bit of reconciliation. My brother actually wrote a three-word note, I forgive you, over some of the things. And this, wow. this all happened after the book was out, so people don't know that. My great fear was that I was going to make everything worse. Actually, the book kind of helped bring them together in a way they had not been for the last 50 years. Wow, that is incredible. Yeah, I thank you for sharing that as well, because, yeah, reading the end of the book, it's kind of... I'm wondering what what is going to happen. So right. maybe yeah. I should write an, an appendix or something. <laughs> yeah, there we, there we go. Yeah, it's a yeah cliffhanger, but it has a yeah kind of a great ending there. Uh, in the in the memoir, you mentioned that uh, Dr. Paul Brand was someone who helped really shape the foundation of your faith, and you know seemed to fill a, a father figure kind of role for you. Can yeah. you share just uh, first of all, how did you meet Dr. Brand? Yes, he became. As you say, a father figure, kind of a surrogate father, and and I thought, uh, you know, that's not all bad. You get to choose the father that you want. It came about in a very serendipitous way. I was writing a book called "Where Is God When It Hurts." My, hurts. My first book. I was 46 years old, and I was spending a lot of time in libraries reading books on the problem of pain and the curse of pain and how to stop hurting and things like that. And my wife was working in a medical supply house that would ship medicines to mission hospitals overseas primarily, she came across a speech that he gave called The Gift of Pain. Hmm. And she took it home. She said, Philip, you know, you're writing about the problem of pain. Here's a different point of view, The Gift of Pain. And indeed, it was a, a different point of view. He worked with leprosy patients and one of the most feared diseases, often wrongly so. And so Dr. Ren would say, if I had one gift to give my leprosy patients, it would be the gift of pain. And that was a whole new concept to me. So I called him up out of the blue and explained that I was writing a book and I would like to come interview him. And he, he was a little hesitant. He said, well, how about if I just sit out in the hallway and when you have a few minutes for a coffee break or something, I can ask you a question. Maybe we can go out to a meal. And that's how it started. We, I went down there and spent a week. Eventually, I spent about 10 years of my writing life following him around the world and draining from him all of the wisdom and then trying to present it in a way uh, that other people could encounter because he had never written before. Yeah, so like God was really bringing you together for that partnership. In fact, uh, he died in, in 2003. We were kind of an odd couple. I was in my 20s. He was a distinguished, silver-haired, British, British accent surgeon and spent most of his life in India. So we couldn't have been more different. 
And yet uh, the, the team worked. And I remember speaking at his funeral and I said, we had a strange exchange, Dr. Brand and I, while I was giving words to his faith, he was actually giving faith to my words because I was in a kind of a church wounded background. And I had that cocoon period of time with him when I was able to go through and put together his words in a way that was convincing, convincing even to me, the one writing them. You know, there's a quote from, I think it's one of the church fathers, Irenaeus, who said, the, the glory of God is a person fully alive. And Dr. Brand was fully alive. He knew the name of every plant, every animal. Uh, he was a pure scientist in one way, but, a, but also a, a, just a grateful Christian, grateful for the creation that God has put us in the middle. And he, he thought it would be it would dishonor the creator not to notice every butterfly, every insect. At, at the same time, he goes to a, li a laboratory every day and works on his scientific experiments. So a man fully alive, and that was a great world model for me. Uh, so you, you did spend, uh, yeah, about a decade that you said um, working and writing with Paul. And uh, so can you share with us uh, some of your experience in meeting and working with people uh, with leprosy? Sure. Primarily that took place in India. We did have a leprosarium in the United States. About 3,000 people at that time had active cases of leprosy in the U.S. Many of them were immigrants from countries where it was endemic, like uh, Vietnam, India, places like that. But uh, I, I got to know people who had, especially in India, grown up being treated like the lowest of the low. I mean, they would actually be kicked out, I'm talking about with a shoe, booted out of their family, of their village. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't live anywhere. They would just kind of hang around a pile of rocks and hope someone brought them a bucket full of food every once in a while. And because of missions like Effect Hope, there is good treatment available. So it's a matter of diagnosing it and starting the treatment. And one of the beautiful things, Darcy, is that virtually all of the advances in the treatment of leprosy came from Christian missionaries. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily because they were the best scientists in the world or the best doctors, although many of them were at the top of their field, but because they were the only willing only ones willing to work with a leprosy patient. The fear was that deep. It's a beautiful example of following Jesus' command to reach out to the unwanted, to the marginalized, to the least valued human beings. Leprosy patients in India, in the untouchable caste especially, were right at the bottom of the social ladder. I can't think of any group that is lower on the social ladder. And these missionaries for centuries have been going to them, ministering to them, risking their own fears uh, of what would take place uh, so that they could show God's love. Uh, uh, there, was, there was one account um, from one of your books um, of meeting a gentleman that you called Lou uh, mm. who you know was losing his sight and uh, his touch and wasn't able to play music and it, it was you know he was feeling it physically but also uh, you know the mental um, and emotional kind of damage as well. Uh, could you tell us a, a little bit more about that? Yes, I've had several people like Lou. It started by, of course, the disease manifesting itself, and maybe they would lose some fingers and, and toes and very often go blind. And about a third of people with leprosy go blind. So you lose that connection. And then, of course, you, uh, you lose the, the feeling of touch, that primal sense. So sadly, many, some of the drugs that are used to treat leprosy have the side effect of affecting hearing. So Lou was one of these people who was gradually just kind of withdrawing from the world. And Lou was one of those people with music, with the auto harp, I think he was from Hawaii as well, was his one connection. And they were able to restore enough uh, protection in, in a glove especially made for him so that he could continue to play the auto harp. And he was, uh, they had this little chapel with just a few people who would come to regular services where Dr. Brand would preach. And, and Lou, with his big smile that was his time to reconnect with the auto harp and he couldn't hear it very well but he could play it and just know that other people were being ministered to and that, that was his main connection with the community around him if we come back to uh, for a second the idea of uh, pain as a gift mm. uh, you kind of um, you know I touched on this uh, briefly but there's a, there's a quote um, 
that Dr. Brand said, uh, pain is often seen as the great inhibitor that keeps us from happiness, but actually it's a giver of freedom. Uh, can you, yeah, can you explain that a little bit? One of the prize patients uh, they dealt with in India was a man named Sadan, Sada Gopan, but he shortened it for us foreigners to call him Sadan. And unlike a lot of the leprosy patients, he was not lower caste, he was upper caste. He was an accountant, had a good job, but when the signs of leprosy appeared, he was you know, kicked out of his village. And he found his way finally to the hospital where he heard there was one orthopedic surgeon Dr. Paul Brand, who was working with leprosy patients. So he did many surgeries, kind of putting his fingers back together. And, and, and finally they thought, he thought, I, I'm ready to go home. I want to show them how far I've come in my family. Uh, that night, he fell asleep, of course. He's, he's sleeping on a mat on the floor. And when he woke up in the morning, his, his arm was just kind of a mangled mess. And what happened? Brace yourself was that a rat had come in the night and it chewed on his arm. And because he felt no pain, he didn't feel it. Well, he was wow. just distraught. What? Because he knew all that Dr. Brand and his wife, Margaret Brand, had, had invested in him. But he had one more night to spin. And he said, I can't even go to sleep. I don't even have the freedom to sleep with this disease. So he decided to stay up all night. He got one of his accounting textbooks and was sitting there there was a kerosene lamp beside him. You probably know where this is going. And his other hand fell into the kerosene lamp and just rested on that hot glass for a while. And he didn't know it or feel it. And then later he saw the burn. And he, he's the one who came in just in tears when he came back after the weekend and said to Dr. Brand, I'll never be free as long as I have the disease. And in this case, he couldn't even sleep safely. He, he lost the use of part of his hands because of this disease of leprosy. He was not free. You know, pain is a way that offers us freedom. Uh, that's a great story that illustrates us. But, uh, you know, for someone like me to think of it as a gift, uh, can you kind of put that in perspective for me? I'll put it this way. Pain is the most effective language that your body can find to alert you to something that needs attention. That's what pain is. I mean, it's built into a, every cell of our body. And uh, if there's a warning, if your body has a problem, whether it's an aching joint or whether it's a, a heart that's racing or a, or a fever, you know, anything that's going on, your body has a way to alert you so that you'll pay attention. So I see it as a process of or well, maybe it goes too far to say befriending pain, but in, but understanding that it it it's not your enemy. It's something that your body is doing to force you to pay attention that you wouldn't know about otherwise. So in that way, it's a gift. How did your relationship with Dr. Brand really change your outlook on, you know, just humanity and faith and hope? Yes, well... There's one statement that Jesus made that's repeated more often in the Gospels than any other statement, six times, and with some variations in the wording. But he, what he said was, and I'm paraphrasing here, he said, you don't find your life by acquiring, by grasping, by wanting more and more. You find your life by giving it away. And I would add in service to others. And when you do that, you actually find it. And I, I know of no one in my experience, who who fulfills that better than Dr. Paul Brand? Here's a brilliant surgeon who has won every award that you can win in medicine, who uh, was offered the head of orthopedics at Stanford University Hospital or at Oxford University Medical School, and he turned them down to work with, again, the lowest people on the planet, people who were in the lowest caste usually in, in India, who had leprosy. And yet, I have never once looked at Dr. Brand with pity. Dr. Brand was a fulfilled human being. He found his life by giving it away. And that's yeah, that is that is a great takeaway. But when uh, we're talking about books like, you know, Where's God When It Hurts, Gift of Pain, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, what is kind of one of your hopes for the readers? Uh, like, what is a, a, a takeaway from these books? 
I came up with a slogan um, as I think about pain. And it goes like this. Pain redeemed impresses me more than pain removed. Pain redeemed impresses me more than pain removed. When pain happens, we want to get rid of it as soon as possible. We, that's the point, you know, that's why pain exists, to make you pay attention to something that, that needs attention. And often that doesn't happen, doesn't with terminal diseases. We all know, uh, of course, the people that affect hope works with around the world, these tropical diseases. It doesn't get removed. Sometimes you have to live with it. I have found, just as a journalist, I have found that some of those people learn more and grow more. In fact, I've seen surveys where they would ask people, at, at what time in your life did you grow most spiritually? 80% of the people who answer talk about a hard time, a difficult time. But we look back on those and say, that, that forced me to depend on other people, to depend on God. I learned some important lessons. So just this year, as we're talking, Darcy, I was diagnosed with a disease Parkinson's disease, which is a degenerative disease, and it can be very serious. So far, mine has not been. I'm in the early stages, but I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to learn. What can I learn already about being dependent on other people? It's, it's a humbling disease. It's makes, it makes me much more compassionate and sensitive to people who have other disabilities. And in that way, uh, I believe that even though it, there may be a good amount of suffering in my future. I, I do believe the promise that Paul says very, very sweepingly. He says, no matter what happens, and if you look at his life, it included a lot of pain and suffering. No matter what happens, God can use it for our own good. Romans 8, 28. We working together with God can be better people, can learn lessons that are important to our humanity. Pain redeem impresses me more than pain removed. God is the great recycler. No matter what happens, God can somehow work good out of it in our lives. Uh, a great note to end on there. As I said, I, I would love to do this all day with you here, but I, I really appreciate your time with us. I just want to thank you again. Uh, thank you um, on behalf of Effect Hope as well, and uh, all the people that yeah, have been uh, blessed and encouraged by your words today. Well, it's been a delight to speak with you, and I look forward to meeting my readers in the Toronto area very soon in September. <laughs>